Okay, so this audio lecture is going to be about alpha-gal syndrome. So this is meant to be kind of like a case study for allergies. So make sure you go listen to the allergies audio lecture. So allergies are type 1 hypersensitivities. Um, when we're looking at the immune response for them. And mast cells are really important. And there are your classic presentations of allergies. And then there's alpha-gal syndrome. So alpha-gal syndrome is kind of like the Lyme's disease of the South originally. Um, it is an allergy that is transmitted by a tick bite, though there are additional um, vectors that are believed to cause alpha-gal syndrome. So alpha-gal syndrome is an allergic reaction to um, alpha-galactoglose, which is a sugar. Okay, so... Um, and it's then abbreviated as alpha-gal. So you'll hear me talk about alpha-gal from now on. And just whenever I say alpha-gal, it's alpha galactose os, 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 sugar. So there is an enzyme that goes by the same name. And there's a different disorder created by that enzyme. <clears throat> there is another enzyme that mammals use to create this sugar. Um, humans lack that enzyme. So humans cannot make alpha-gal, the sugar. Okay. So <clears throat> because we don't make it, if it's introduced into our body and gets past our gut barrier, um, we can develop an allergic reaction to it. So again, keep in mind what we learned about with allergies and B cells going undergo class switching to produce IgE's um, antibodies, right? So, and it's believed that with a tick bite and more specifically in the US, the Lone Star tick, that this introduces some of this alpha-gal sugar in the bite and then again antibodies pursue and allergic reactions happen. So generally the response is to products that contain or derived from mammals that contain alpha-gal. This can include <clears throat> mammalian meats but milk, dairy products, also gelatin <laughs> if it's coming from mammalian so so source. Um, medication and medical products can be derived from mammalian sources, so those can create issues. Also, personal products, lotions, makeups, um, menstrual products um, have mammalian products in them in some cases, so individuals can react to all these. So a lot of times it's considered a food allergy, but it's a lot more than just a food allergy. Um, and then for some people, they are sensitive enough that if someone near them has alpha-gal on them, like say they put a lotion on, you could respond to that lotion, even though you didn't directly put it on. And again, keep in mind that how the allergen is introduced also affects how, what symptoms you get and what response you get, right? So if someone's putting lotion on in their skin, that's going to be a skin contact and skin mass cells get degranulate and that might present differently than if you ate some food. And also remember concentration matters. So something like mammalian meat is going to have a high concentration of alpha-gal or something like a medication might have a very low concentration of it. Reactions can be life-threatening. Um, so about 60, you'll see in another slide, about 60% of individuals with alpha-gal syndrome have an anaphylactic event at least once. Um, other individuals have multiple anaphylactic events within a week. <laughs> um, so it all varies depending upon how much they're able to control um, the syndrome. Um, in some cases, it can be immediate, but in many cases, it's delayed. Okay, so immediate reactions usually are because there's some, some kind of injection of a drug that has alpha-gal in it, and there's a response. And that's actually how alpha-gal was identified, was there was a monoclonal, monoclonal antibody that was being used for cancer, and there were some individuals that immediately had um, an anaphylactic event, an allergic reaction, even though they, it was the first time receiving that drug, and that's very atypical. Um, so those individuals were looked at, and it was found that they had um, antibodies. The drug was also made in two different cell lines. One cell line actually had, was a high, high expressor of alpha-gal. The other one's a low expressor of alpha-gal. So individuals only had anaphylactic events if they were injected with one. That drug was the drug that got Martha Stewart in, <laughs> in trouble for insider trading. Um, so lots of fun facts when it comes to alpha-gal syndrome. Uh, and again, um, but it's typically delayed, and so anywhere from 
um, hours to in I know the um, information here says 10 hours but individuals can have reactions that don't start until 24 after 24 hours after exposure from from a trigger um, so lots of different ways that this is different than your traditional right which actually is a nice kind of case study because you can think about what's normal and then what's abnormal about alpha gal syndrome so one of the key differences is that generally allergies are to proteins and for alpha gal syndrome alpha gal is a carbohydrate it's a sugar and so the the epitope the allergen is a sugar now, individuals with alpha-gal syndrome can go on to develop protein allergies, so they'll initially have a carbohydrate allergy due to the tick bite, but then they will end up recruiting B cells that recognize proteins that are on the meats that they're, they've accidentally consumed or come across. Um, also very different from a traditional allergy that it is introduced by a tick bite. Um, again, there's some additional... Um, proposed vectors such as fleas and sugars that we find in the south um, but the lone star tick is the one in the u.s that has been identified other countries it's different species of ticks that cause it so it's not just lone star ticks globe that because lone star ticks aren't found in other countries but um, alpha gal syndrome mammalian meat allergy is found in other um, countries in other continents also um <clears throat> So again, um, generally an individual would have a food allergy and that's like, I, wanna, I don't want to say that's it, um, but with alpha-gal syndrome, it's food allergies, but it can also be hypersensitivities to drugs and medical products that contain alpha-gal. So again, it goes beyond just what you're eating um, from a food standpoint for that. And also a lot of individuals with alpha-gal syndrome develop a um, allergies to other items not just the proteins of the meats but other foods they're eating and as I mentioned this can be due to like leaky gut because of the inflammation that's occurring generally with alpha-gal syndrome the onset is more in adulthood um, it's less common for onset to be in childhood though there are um, there are children that are diagnosed with this and that have symptoms of it we also know that the fat content makes a difference. And again, this is very different than other allergies. So other allergies, if it's present, you respond. Um, with alpha-gal syndrome, high fat foods tend to elicit a response versus lean. So some individuals can um, kind of get by with um, low fat. Um, so if they have, if some people are allergic to dairy products, other ones aren't. So if you're allergic to dairy, if you're not allergic to dairy products and you have low fat, that tends not to be an issue. But maybe if you have a high fat, um, like a cream versus skim milk, um, that would make a difference in whether you're going to respond. And again, typically um, the response is delayed, but individuals that develop protein allergies can have instant um, responses. And that kind of goes with the syndrome, right? So um, the syndrome is more than just the allergy to the carbohydrate it encompasses uh, additional allergies to the proteins that are found in the meat and then um, also individuals can have like mast cell activation syndrome too um, and that kind of gets encompassed into the syndrome and again reactions um, can be to other things like drugs and medical products. Um, so things like heparin that is derived from pigs, that would be an issue for someone with alpha-gal that would potentially kill them. Also, if we look at grafts, um, grafts can make, um, if they're derived from um, pig or bovine, um, those could lead to issues as far as rejection, but rejection beyond what a normal um, individual would have. There's additional features. Um, so there's also non-classical signs um, so that are not what we would recognize as classical allergic reactions. So about 20% of the cases only have GI symptoms. They don't present with anything else. So um, recent work that was just presented at a conference showed that it was 40% of indi individuals with IBS um, actually had alpha-gal IgE antibodies. So... Um, there is speculation that 
um, a number of individuals with IBS actually might have alpha-gal syndrome. Also, it can present with joint pain, so individuals get, will get diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, or with arthritis, sorry, um, but that actually just derives from the inflammation due to the allergic reaction. Um, you can also have so there's some additional um, atypical features of alpha-gal syndrome. Um, so one of them is that individuals can present with non-classical allergic symptoms um, that are actually caused by the allergic reaction. So up to 70% of alpha-gal individuals only present with Ig symptoms. Um, so they don't have, again, they don't have a classic pr presentation. There was a recent um, study that showed that there are individuals that have been classified as having IBS, that when they screen them for alpha-gal antibodies, IgE, um, they actually have those. A recent pres um, presentation, just looking at a broad group of individuals of, with IBS, um, showed that about 40% of those individuals that had IBS actually have alpha-gal syndrome. Um, so some individuals with IBS find relief by in, in, encompassing the alpha-gal diet, um, and that's a big, would be a um, key sign that they actually had alpha-gal syndrome, and they were one of these Ig um, presenters. Some individuals present classically, some present with alpha-gal, and some have no presentation or asymptomatic, okay? Another chronic um, kind of misdiagnosis is arthritis. Um, so because of the inflammation due to the allergic reaction, uh, the individuals can have joint pain. Um, so now you've got an individual <laughs> with IBS, arthritis. Um, and then we can also have chronic pruritus, which is itchy skin. Um, and that's due to all the histamine um, um, present. But again, they, that wouldn't develop into... Um, having hives. Um, so just like an itchy skin, like bugs are crawling underneath your skin. Okay. Um, also it, the reactions are really varied both between the community of individuals with alpha-gal syndrome, but also within the individual. Um, so individuals, um, cofactors are so important. So again, things like exercise, alcohol intake, stress levels can affect, again, your histamine buckets, and that affects whether you respond and the severity of the response. Uh, with alpha-gal syndrome, um, up to 60% six, of individuals will experience um, an anaphylactic reaction. Again, this is where it's critical to recognize that anaphylactic reaction is just not being, is not just the symptom of not being able to breathe. Um, additional um, systems can be affected. And so, and again, um, some individuals have chronic anaphylactic reactions, so they can be having multiple anaphylactic, uh, anaphylactic reactions um, per week. Other individuals may only have one incidence of anaphylactic reaction. Uh, some of that relates to the removal of the allergen from their environment and their diet. Um, reactions can be airborne, um, so just the fumes from someone cooking meat in the house can lead to a reaction, um, just like someone applying lotion that has um, alpha-gal in it could lead to reaction. Um, the, and for some individuals, um, they can have increase or decreased reactivity based on additional tick bites, so generally it's advised not to have additional tick bites because additional tick bites can lead, um, in most cases, to an increase in reactivity, um, though for some people, um, additional tick bites, you can kind of think of those as allergy shots, and they can actually re lead to a decrease. And you just don't know which side you're going to be on. And just like with alpha-gal syndrome, individuals can develop protein allergies. Um, a lot of them will actually develop um, a more severe reaction to insect bites. Um, so where they might have just not had any reaction to an insect bite, now they'll have like a large welt hive present um, or even go into anaphylactic shock due to like a wasp sting where they never would have had that prior to it. Um, in some cases, um, people will have chronic spontaneous um, hives, and so that's one of the, that's another area where if you have idiopathic hives um, that don't have a cause that's been identified, um, it's recommended that you're screened for alpha-gal syndrome. 
Um, also with the anaphylactic, um, it's known as um, midnight um, anaphylactic. And so if you're having an anaphylactic event that is not tied immediately after you eat, so if you're waking up in the middle of the night and you're having an allergic reaction, um, that is another indicator that you might have alpha gal syndrome. Um, luckily, very few people <laughs> report having um, swelling and itching of the mouth and the tongue. And a number of individuals, um, three to five percent end up developing um, mast cell activation syndrome. Um, so that creates uh, um, a whole other set of problems with mass activation syndrome. Um, you end up just kind of reacting to everything. Um, so there's no rhyme or reason, which then means a lot of times you end up going in for additional testing with your allergist, and that might be a um, blood test, and you get identified with having allergies for a whole lot of other things, but you might just be sensitized. You know, might, you might not actually be allergic to it. And it might be once you get your mast cell activation syndrome kind of under control, you may not have um, as many allergic reactions and events. So... Um, definitely something in the alpha-gal syndrome community we keep in mind is about mast cell activation syndrome. I've kind of already mentioned some of the reactions that can occur, but just so that you're aware, they're extremely varied. And again, one of the hallmarks of this is with alpha-gal syndrome is generally it's delayed. For me, my reactions, if I've ingested something, are three and a half hours. That is my witching hour. I set my timer if I've had something that I'm suspicious of, and three and a half hours later, um, that is again, I, if I haven't usually reacted by four hours, I'm not going to react to it. Um, and if I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh God, my skin's getting all itchy. Oh God, I'm getting highs. I'm like, okay, what happened three and a half hours before? What was I exposed to? Fume reactions tend to be more instant. Um, so if I was to be walking down the street and there's a restaurant and they're cooking, you know, their brunch and the bacon <laughs> smells wafting in the air, I will pretty instantly start having, um, you know, congestion, runny nose, eyes kind of like puff, puffing up, um, even difficulty breathing. If I remove myself from the situation, it tends to resolve. But then about two, three hours later, I will have a second wave where then that is more GI presenting um, and also really fatigued um, for that. If I contact touch something, <laughs> it's about 15 minutes and I will just have a massive hive um, on wherever I touched it. So 4th of July, I made a mistake at the grocery store and I didn't mean to touch the package of beef. I was just showing my son, hey, that's a package of beef and I accidentally touched it. And then within 15 minutes, my arm's itching and my arm is like now um, has one giant hive on it. So fun time. So again, everyone's uh, can have different reactions. Some people aren't sensitive to touch. Um, they're only when they ingest. So again, it's so varied and that makes it very difficult. Um, for the individual, but also for the medical community. And also where it um, is presents so differently than traditional allergies, it's um, difficult for uh, the medical community to truly understand and even to be aware of what it is. And it is a relatively newer um, identified, so it was 2007 um, that it was first identified through that cancer monoclonal antibody. Okay, so if you do think you do have um, alpha gal syndrome, um, definitely you want to reach out to an allergist or a healthcare provider that is knowledgeable about it. Okay, so that's really key. Um, there's a lot of allergists and um, healthcare providers that are not knowledgeable and give bad advice. Um, so many people find social media groups are actually uh, that of individuals with alpha-gal syndrome are the best, or going to a medical provider that either has alpha-gal syndrome or has a family member um, with alpha-gal syndrome is, again, kind of what individuals in the community um, will look for. <laughs> so um, so most of your um, healthcare providers hopefully will tell you to stop eating mammalian meat. Um, so it's not just red meat. Um, so pork is included, lamb, venison, rabbit, um, squirrel, ix, um, bison, buffalo, um, boar, all that, if it has a hoof, um, and then etc. cetera, because uh, no, it doesn't matter what you try to make as a generalization that doesn't work. There's always an exception, right? Um, so ho stopping consuming those mammalian meats is important. 
Um, again, this is something that's varied. Um, venison is one that um, some individuals can handle and some can't. Um, and again, that's kind of um, controversial <laughs> as far as whether it's like an all or nothing kind of thing. Um, push your luck. You don't know what kind of inflammation might be happening kind of thing. So um, depending upon your sensi sensitivity and severity, um, you may be told to avoid additional foods such as cow's milk, milk and gelatin. Um, so that's kind of your second tier. Um, and again, some people uh, um, eliminate all of that. I was actually already allergic to um, milk, casein A1. So I was already in our pretty limited um, dairy <laughs> intake so that that's actually been kind of a blessing because that's usually the dairy is the hardest thing um, people have and just um, one of the things that can happen is your reactions can change so some people who aren't allergic to dairy to begin with become allergic to dairy and um, usually they are they will point fingers at every single thing else and they're like no no it wasn't the cheese I ate no 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 <laughs> like the cheese has alpha gal but for some reason some people don't respond um and then some people um, respond to medications. So you have to look at your medications. So I was one of the ones that responded to medications. So the allergy medicine I was taking actually has mammalian byproducts and was making me worse. And so I just switched to mammalian free uh, medication. So some people have to have their medication compounded um, to make it. I've been fortunate that I there are vegan medications um, that I can take that for anything that I take daily as far as multivitamins because vitamin deficiency goes along with alpha-gal syndrome. Um, and so I could have lived without multivitamins and now I, I have to be on multivitamins to function. Um, and, and my antihistamines, um, those again have to be alpha-gal free. And then with vaccines, certain vaccines are derived um, in mammalian cells and there can be trace amounts of alpha-gal left, and so that becomes a concern. So with the flu shot, um, there are flu shots that are made in non-mammalian cells, um, so those are, except, those are okay and don't lead to allergic reactions. With um, the COVID vaccines, um, though the mRNA vaccines were okay, um, I've heard Pfizer has added casein into their bivalent one, which makes that not okay. So the Moderna one's okay. So again, researching every single thing that's going into your body and making sure that it doesn't potentially contain um, anything. And then also making sure that you're always carrying um, your antihistamines, EpiPens on you because there's a good chance that your medical provider is not going to know that and your pharmacist isn't going to know that. So you might get exposed, you might have an allergic reaction, and then you have to um, treat with that. And again, um, the, you know, basic guidelines are making sure you avoid additional tick bites um, because that can increase your reactivity. Um, so I most likely, I know I received one tick bite, but I probably had a tick bite prior to that because I had, um, I had, blame <laughs> accidental exposure to milk and also IBS issues um, on these other issues and looking back it was most likely actually like a mild case of um, alpha-gal syndrome when I received a second bite um, what was most likely my second bite in um, April of this year by the end of May I was having severe reactions um, in even a non-traditional anaphylactic reaction, which I should have gone to the ER, but I didn't know what was going on and I thought I had COVID. So fun, fun times. <laughs> so just to show you some um, research that's being done on alpha-gal and what's um, currently known and some resources, if you want to learn additional information about alpha-gal syndrome, I'm going to include some information on a couple um, papers. So there's this paper that has potential mechanism because one of the, you know, head scratcher pieces with alpha-gal syndrome is the delayed reaction. So this group proposes some of the mechanisms of how we develop alpha-gal syndrome, but then why is it a delayed reaction? So as I've mentioned, there's this, you know, you get a tick bite, the tick bite, is the, the tick when it attaches, regurgitates into you. And if it has taken a blood meal um, from a mammal, it would have alpha-gal in that regurgitation. Also, and studies have shown that even 
newly hatched um, ticks um, in the larval stage, even though they haven't taken a blood meal, they have alpha gal that's passed on from the mother. Um, so it doesn't really matter what stage the tick is at. It, there's a good chance it could have alpha gal in it. So when it regurgitates into you, so it doesn't have to take a blood meal from you. If it attaches to you, it can transmit some of this alpha gal into you and it's going to then interact with your immune system so that you're going to have your T cells and B cells interacting with each other and then they become activated and your B cells undergo class switching and produce IgE um, antibodies. Those can bind to mast cells and basal fills and lead to degranulation. So then we would end up with these um, allergic reactions that you can see in the panels on the right. So if we eat something like meat, that's going to have a mixture of alpha-gal that is coating the proteins and lipids. So keep in mind, alpha-gal, um, you can think of it as a decorating these other molecules, decorating the proteins, decorating the lipids. And so if it's more so if it's incorporated into the lipids, it gets protected. And so it doesn't break down the same. And so that can get absorbed in through your digestive system and then get into the bloodstream where it can interact with these mast cells that now have the IgEs on their surface and they get degranulated and then you have allergic reaction. If it's protein bound, those tend to, they're not as protected, so they tend to degrade. Um, so as you can see here, there is a different, there seems to be a difference between a high fat lipid um, material versus something that the glyco um, the alpha gal is bound to glycoproteins so with glycoproteins again the alpha gal is not protected so it tends to break down so your immune system doesn't really get to see it it also gets absorbed um, proteins get absorbed quicker in your digestive system so if it was if the protein if it being bound to protein is when it was antigenic um, we would see the responses more at the one hour mark or by the one hour mark with lipids those get absorbed slower and so usually uptake is around four hours or three and a half hours for me <laughs> so everyone's digestive system works a little bit different um, and that can indicate um, again and then go, and again when it's incorporated with lipids the alpha gal is kind of protected so it's not going to be able to break down like it would normally so again this misfortune happens because we've got our tick bite Tick bite's not just secreting alpha-gal protein, but there's all these um, immune modul modulatory molecules um, that it's that your immune system's going to start to kind of respond to and get activated when there's that tick bite, right? So um, you just think about if you're bitten by a tick, you might have like a spot or a welt there. Now, interestingly, individuals with well alpha-gal syndrome, a lot of times um, their tick bite that cause the reaction when they then eat something with alpha gal will also flare and itch and hive up so it becomes like a little indicator <laughs> that oh something's going to be happening just you just wait your three and a half hours maybe you should like preload with some antihistamines just in case so again we're, we're we have a lot of fun facts um and again we're going to have memory b cells that are going to um be activated too so um for some individuals depending upon how strong that memory is, um, they can go into a remission um, where they don't have the allergic reactions after a year, after a couple years. Other individuals um, continue to have allergic reactions um, decades later. So there, even though alpha-gal syndrome was identified more recently, there's individuals that have had, have had alpha-gal syndrome but misdiagnosed with other things um, for I think the in in the groups I'm in I think 30 years is like the longest um, for individuals so it doesn't go away for everybody just like with some people grow out of their allergies other people don't um, so this is an interesting primary paper um, looking at basal fill activation um, so they did basal fill activation tests um, and they were able to differentiate um, between individuals that presented with alpha-gal syndrome versus asymptomatic individuals. Just to show you a little a figure from that. Um, so they are looking at activated basal fills 
And so you can see that the individuals that have alpha-gal syndrome, which are in the red, um, they have higher activation levels than the individuals that are non, have a non-anaphylactic reaction. So they, they are um, asymptomatic um, for um, alpha-gal syndrome, even though they have IgE antibodies, but their basophils just don't get activated. So there's some kind of additional mechanism here at play. It's not just the antibodies are it, right? And this is where cofactors become important because if there's already histamines around, then this can lead to that um, threshold being easier to meet to activate mast cells and basophils. There's definitely a lot of research that needs to be done on alpha-gal syndrome. And one of the hopes is that the more that's learned about alpha-gal syndrome, the better understanding we'll have on other allergies, including food allergies. And just like as more research is done on food allergies, we'll have a better understanding of alpha-gal syndrome. Same thing with tick-borne diseases. The more we have a better understanding of that, we'll have a better understanding of alpha-gal syndrome. Um, but if you do have any questions about it, please don't contact, you know, don't hesitate to contact me. I'm more than happy to talk about it, um, especially seeing that I have firsthand experience living with it.